Hello, everyone. I'm glad that you can join us. We will be getting this webinar started in just a few seconds. I'm just waiting for more folks to join. Uh, we're going to have a full house. Uh, there are over 700 uh, people registered, uh, so giving it a few seconds for everybody to join. <clears throat> okay, I have a minute after three, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Paz Artaza Regan. I'm the program manager at Catholic Climate Covenant. Uh, I'd like to uh, give you a welcome uh, to this webinar, The Root Causes of Climate Change, Understanding Extractive Industries and Their Impacts. Uh, we are delighted uh, to be co-hosting this webinar with the Interreligious Working Group on Extractive Industry, and you're going to be hearing more about that group in a few minutes. Um, before we get started, we always start with prayer. Uh, so if you could join me um, by always remember, you know, centering ourselves and always remembering that we are in the presence of God. Uh, we're going to start with this uh, prayer from the Jesuit Ecological Examine. Start with a sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. We give thanks to God for creation and for being wonderfully made. We ask for the grace to see creation as God does, in all its splendor and suffering. We ask for the grace to look closely to see how our life choices impact creation, the poor, and the vulnerable. We ask for the grace of conversion towards ecological justice and reconciliation. We ask for the grace to reconcile our relationship with God, creation, and humanity, and to stand in solidarity through our actions. Amen. Amen. A couple of uh, details, uh, as we call housekeeping. Uh, you will notice you have a control panel on the side of your computer. That control panel uh, allows you to listen in via computer or phone call. If you're having audio issues, it is almost always because of a Wi-Fi connection issue. You can switch to phone call and get your audio that way. So if you click there on phone call, it'll give you the details of where to call and how to call in. The video, uh, we are going to be recording this webinar and you will be getting a link to the recording within the next couple of days. Uh, you may submit questions for the Q&A session. In the uh, control panel, there's a little section called questions. That is the area where you can type in your questions. If you can, um, let me know who the question is for. Uh, that way I can direct it at some point. Uh, right now, we are going to start. I'm going to introduce our three panelists uh, in the order that they will be speaking. Uh, Marianne Comfort is going to go first, followed by Sister Joan Brown, and then Father Peter Hughes. Uh, Marianne is Justice Coordinator for Earth Anti-Racism and Women for the Sister of Mercy of the Americas. In that role, she chairs the Interreligious Working Group on Extractive Industries and facilitates a working group of Mercy Sisters concerned about extractivism. Joan Brown is a Franciscan sister from the Rochester, Minnesota community. Her Kansas farm roots in the Flint Hills have formed her and continue to inform and ground her sacred worldview and ministry as the executive director of the New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light. Her work with people and communities in New Mexico takes an integral ecology approach, helping people make connections between climate injustice, economic disparity, immigration, refugees, health and dignity of life for all sacred creation and communities. The Ministry of, the New, of New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light includes education, inspiration, assisting houses of worship to an energy efficiency, conservation, solar installations, and public policy advocacy. Father Peter Hughes is an Irish Columban priest who has spent five decades as a missionary based in Latin America, primarily in Peru. 
Father Hughes is an advisor to CELAM, the Collegial Council of Latin American Bishops, and is a board member of REPAM, the Panamazonia Ecclesial Network, an initiative to respond to the challenges facing the people of the Amazon and their natural environment. I am incredibly excited to have three, three uh, panelists. Uh, and one of the reasons is that I believe that the strength of the Catholic ministry on creation care lies on the shoulders of the religious sisters, brothers, and missionaries more than anybody else. So at this point, we're going to be hearing first from Marianne. Marianne, go ahead. Thanks so much, Paz. Um, the Interreligious Working Group on Extractive Industries is really pleased to co-sponsor this webinar. We're a Washington, D.C.-based group of faith organizations and partners, and our active members include, besides the Sisters of Mercy, uh, the Columban Center for Advocacy and Outreach, Mary Knoll Office of Global Concern, the Jesuit Conference of the U.S. and Canada, and the Justice and Peace Office of the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate. Um, for several years now, we've been engaged in education and advocacy around what we call the extractivist model of development or extractivism. We're also in solidarity with impacted communities. Over the years, our list of concerns has expanded beyond precious metal mining, oil and gas drilling and fracking to other forms of exploitation on a large scale such as massive logging operations and land grabs for monoculture farming, such as palm oil plantations. You can see that the extractivist developed model is quite far reaching. And so today we're really gonna be focusing on one of the results of this mindset, climate change. Next slide. We all know that Pope Francis has been quite outspoken about the urgency of addressing climate change this past summer, he went a step further in his meeting with oil executives. He clearly connected the carbon emissions that are contributing to global warming to the continued extraction of fossil fuels, and he called for keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Next slide. Our working group has been exploring the connections between this extractivist model of development and climate change, and I'll share with you just some of our thinking around this. First of all, we recognize that in addition to addressing the impacts of climate change, we also need to address the impacts of the actual extraction, transportation, and processing of the fossil fuels that contribute to climate change. So while we advocate with communities threatened by rising sea levels, magnified storms, and extreme heat, we also advocate with communities whose land, air, and water is being polluted by nearby extractive industries, and also those at risk from associated infrastructure, such as pipelines. So we stand with people of low-lying islands in the Pacific who are losing their homes, as well as with the Standing Rock Sioux who are opposing a pipeline near their land, and with communities living in the shadow of polluting oil refineries. We also recognize our complicity as consumers. Are we increasing demand for this fossil fuel extraction by not giving as much attention as we could to conserving oil and gas and fossil fuel generated electricity? And we also recognize that as large scale operations, extractive industries themselves are real um, large emitters of carbon that contribute to climate change. So we need to address that. And finally, I think what's uh, something that often gets lost in this discussion is we need to be attentive to how we address climate change. We don't want alternatives to fossil fuels to become new forms of extractivism. For instance, we might consider hydroelectric power a clean form of energy because it doesn't emit carbon, but large scale dams are displacing indigenous peoples and disrupting ecosystems around the world. Similarly, we don't wanna be cutting down forest to set up solar farms. So we really wanna make sure that when we're looking at addressing climate change, we're still paying attention to human rights and um, the environment in putting out and um, forming those alternatives. I'll return later to talk about some ways we all can respond to extractivism. So for now, I'm grateful that we'll have two other speakers who can share with us some perspectives from very different parts of the world. 
Thank you, Marianne, uh, for that introduction. Uh, now we're going to hear uh, from Sister Joan Brown, uh, who will give us uh, the perspective from uh, the um, New Mexico area in the U.S. Thank you so much, panelists and <clears throat> pause and everybody who has joined in. It's my blessing and privilege to be here today. So uh, I'm going to offer uh, sort of a case study of New Mexico, which is in the United States. Next slide, please. And um, we, uh, in working with New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light on climate change, are heavily involved in um, extractivism because it's so much part of our state. In fact, we call our state a sacrifice zone, which the definition for that is <clears throat> communities or areas where um, people are um, taken advantage of, um, you know, to the detriment of their human rights and to, and to the earth herself. So I'd like to start out with just this map of New Mexico. So you kind of get a picture of who we are. <clears throat> and this map actually we created as a um, teaching tool um, to work with a number of communities because of all the extractivism in our state. So it shows um, up in the uh, four corners or the um, left upper corner, the um, red is the methane pollution that we have from oil and gas. I'll talk about that more later. We have the gray circles in several places which are from coal fired power plants. Um, we have uh, different pollution from fires around Los Alamos, which is the uh, part of the nuclear fuel chain. And in the center part of the state to the left, we have a whole uranium legacy issue. And then uh, down in the uh, right hand lower corner, as well as the up left hand corner, we have a lot of oil and gas um, industry. So um, um, next slide, please. So just to give you a sense. So I'd like to start out by just giving a few um, sociological statistics of our state and who we are, because I, I really believe that that interfaces in with why an area becomes a sacrifice zone and uh, more prone to extractivism and less regulations for that and also ends up in poverty. So um, New Mexico uh, became a state in 1912, but we were colonized by Spain in 1598. Um, our median income is about 43,000. Uh, one in five people live in poverty. According to the 2018 Prosperity uh, Family Index, New Mexico was last at 3.35. And uh, we usually rank near the bottom in most indices, especially around child welfare, education, poverty, food security, and also employment. And uh, one would think that this is counterintuitive since we have so much extractive industry and have historically in this state since the 1940s. But it kind of goes along with those areas that are heavily extracted also end up suffering the most from that and have a boom bust economic cycle and suffer from that. Um, in New Mexico, 25% of all New Mexican children under 18 live in poverty and 40% of the Native American children do. We are a very culturally diverse place, 47% Hispanic. These figures are um, more or less correct. It was difficult to find actual f figures. They're kind of fudge a little bit in different ways, but basically 47% Hispanic, um, over 10% Native American and about 41% Anglo. And the picture is of some of our faith folks at a methane pollution hearing um, up in the Four Corners area. Next slide, please. So uh, with this, we have extractivism statistics. So uh, mo much of New Mexico is federal land. So it's under federal jurisdiction. Um, then we also have many suburban nations, 18 Pueblos and uh, Navajo and Hickory Apache. Uh, land. We are a split estate, which means that people can own the land, but they don't um, have control of the minerals underneath. So somebody could come in on anybody's land and hydrofrack underneath their land to get a mineral. Um, right now, we're about third nationally in oil and gas production, and there's a large boom in the Permian Basin, which is that southeastern part of the state, which I'll show you again in a minute poised to be maybe second in the country by the end of this year. We're eighth in natural gas, second in copper, and first in potash. And um, I don't have it here because there's not uh, uranium being mined currently, but we have the second largest reserves of uranium. And the picture you here see here is some of our Navajo friends at um, an event that we hold, that they hold annually to uh, remember a um, very large uh, uranium spill um, in the 
in our land. Next slide, please. So here's our map again, uh, just to give you after those statistics, kind of an, uh, a bird's eye view of where we are and who we are. Um, next slide, please. And this shows the oil and gas um, production, which I'm gonna be talking about uh, mostly since that's uh, 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 one of our major focuses at this point, that in dealing with the legacy issues of the uranium uh, Michael, mining and the nuclear fuel cycle, again, up in the, um, uh, upper left, you'll see the uh, largest um, um, methane pollution cloud in the whole country of the United States. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And all of those black dots that you see everywhere are oil and gas production in the state. We're also fighting in the very central part of the state, oil and gas production, which would have the potential of ruining the aquifer and water for the largest population in the state. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just quickly talk, and I'm just going to let you read this, or you can see it later too, um, ecological and social challenges. And when we talk about extractivism, we talk about it in terms increasingly more than just the element that's being extracted, but extractivism of culture, of human dignity, a sacredness of land and communities. The picture, for instance, is one of uh, faith leaders um, who went to um, Bears ears last year trying to protect that area in solidarity with our Native American friends from um, oil, gas, uranium, and other uh, mining. Um, the uh, culture is very important, human dignity. So we run into those issues, especially with our Native American brothers and sisters, the Chaco Canyon area with oil and gas, um, human rights with the Permian Basin, and of course the Grants Uranium Mining Belt where we have legacy of uranium mining. Extractivism is also of the social and physical health of peoples and communities, which involves um, health implications of asthma, cancers, more domestic violence, sexual abuse of women, drugs and alcohol, damaged roads, increased traffic accidents. Those are all part of the social physical health. And it's also an extraction of economy for short term profit. And it's not just the industry itself, but it's also um, the companies in our state, at least the major large companies do not have their corporate headquarters here. They're in other uh, places, as well as the large banks. Um, we say that, well, we need jobs, but oftentimes people from other areas come in to take the jobs um, as well. And then we're left with a cleanup that um, in some cases has not happened and may never happen. And finally, it's extraction of long-term ecological health in the water, land, and air. As an example, we have 300 abandoned legacy uh, uranium mines and 1,000 and abandoned prospects of, of uranium at this point in the state um, that have not been cleaned up and Superfund sites. We have the legacy, of course, of the nuclear power plants, which um, our brothers and sisters on the East Coast especially are uh, gaining electricity from nuclear power. There's no place to put those high level spent nuclear fuel rods. And now there's a proposal to put them here in New Mexico. We don't even have one single nuclear power plant. So there's huge um, ecological justice concerns. Next slide. So um, with this, there are deep connections with climate uh, change. Um, in terms of oil and gas industry, um, it's it's very high. We have venting, flaring, and leaks, and the pollution in New Mexico alone is equal to approximately 12 coal-fired power plants. Um, and this, if it's not dealt with, which could easily be dealt with, uh, is poised to increase 25% uh, over 10 years. And methane at this point, um, from all this leaking, venting, and flaring, which can be stopped, um, is um, cause of 25% of global warming and in the short term traps 80 times more heat in the atmosphere than the same amount of carbon dioxide. Um, we also have huge water issues um, here in the arid west and that's part of extractivism and um, hydrofracking um, can utilize between two and eight million gallons of our sister water per fracked well. Those wells can be used again and again, which involves not only more water, but also uh, more potential of uh, chemical um, spillage, leakage, and affecting. And in this state, um, and this is 
as current as we can get. Right now we're in a huge boom in that southeast po south, uh, east part of the state in the Permian Basin, um, but up to 182 to $244 million worth of natural gas is lost in New Mexico each year. And we lose at least $27 million from that waste uh, that's, that is wasted and not utilized um, that would go to our education budget. And again, we're uh, 49th or 50th in education. The picture is of an immersion experience we had up in the Chaco Canyon area at one of our churches, Librook Community Missions. Next slide, please. So, um, and I am getting near the end now. So I, just a couple of um, these statistics about the venting, flaring and wasting of methane um, that this uh, could um, heat um, and offer cooking needs for every home in our state. And again, um, 180 to $244 million wasted. Next slide. And um, just to note that a large methane cloud, which now you see in perspective of the whole country, all those yellow spots are where there's methane leakage. And you see that bright red area in the middle of the country where we are. And this was first found in 2014 by NASA. They thought it was an anomaly. It's the size of Delaware. This hot spot is still there. Um, further research found out that uh, most of it is coming from the uh, venting, flaring, and wasting of methane gas. And 75% uh, of this could be addressed um, and is in some other states. Um, related to that, the um, last intergovernmental panel on climate change noted that this methane waste would be a quick fix to address a large percentage of methane causing uh, climate change in our country. Next slide, please. So um, I have some just some questions and difficult conversations I'd like to put forward and then a slide about some things that we can do just real, real briefly. Um, so oftentimes in um, rural areas, we, we feel there's a separation between the urban and the rural, and um, we want just transitions and we need to move in that way from extractions to renewable energy, and that is possible. But there's also this burden of job loss and it's um, less easy to get jobs in uh, ur rural areas than urban. So how do we grapple with this issue of equity? Um, and especially when in the past and even now, it's more populated areas uh, that, uh, and more wealthy you know, areas maybe, that are uh, benefiting from the energy use. And also to keep in mind that often this is at the expense of indigenous peoples, culture and land. A second thought is, um, what does our en use of energy harm? Who does our en use of energy harm in the entire energy chain? And this echoes the theme of the Catholic Climate Covenant, who is under my carbon footprint? Um, and for instance, the um, climate injustices and the equity challenges, the, the nuclear power plant issue that I noted was one, oil and gas would be another one. And then the final, um, difficult conversation we all need to have is um, how do we address all of this um, and include faith communities because we have a unique role to facilitate conversations. Next slide, please. And what we can do, I'm just gonna leave this because you can uh, look at this later, um, but these, most of this has to do with um, the methane pollution rules. We're in a comment period now. It also offers some resources for people that you might use around the um, oil and gas industry. So thank you very, very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, and just to let everybody know, you will also be getting a copy of, I mean, a link to the slides that you can download. Um, thank you, Joan, uh, for that uh, exhaustive look at New Mexico extraction issues. Um, at this point, we move south uh, to the Amazon area. Uh, and we'll have Father Peter join us. And Father Peter's going to be joining us. Um, he is, his audio might be a little difficult since he's on Wi-Fi, uh, but hopefully it'll work. Uh, Father Peter? Yes, thank you very much. I hope everything works out with the technology end of things. Anyway, good afternoon, everybody, and it's lovely to be part of the conversation. Uh, what I have to say really will be will be based and uh, will continue 
from the wonderful things that both Marianne and uh, Joan have just uh, shared. My perspective will be, uh, as Pass has just said, from the Amazon, how the extractives and how they're affecting life for the people and the, the huge Amazon area and uh, the relationship between the destruction that the extractive industries are causing to, to climate change uh, on a global level, on, on a planetary level. So I'd briefly like to share with you uh, three, three points. Uh, the first will be in relation to the Amazon itself, uh, what's happening uh, there, um, the region in relation to climate change. The second will be to try and um, share with you some thing in, on the level of the destruction or the depredation of the Amazon, the rainforest and the destruction of land. And uh, the third point will be about the response of the, the faith community of the, the church and the churches, and particularly the um, interest and focus of uh, Pope Francis. First of all, about the Amazon. Um, as you know, geographically, it's in the heart of the the, the subcontinent of Latin America. It's a, a huge area of uh, 8 million square kilometers that's shared by nine countries, the biggest of which is Brazil. Brazil covers about two thirds of the geographical area of the Amazon and uh, the rest are shared by the eight other countries uh, in smaller uh, amounts, but still significant in relation to their own size. Most of the countries that uh, occupy the Amazon area, particularly on the Pacific coast, uh, up to one half or more than a half of their land mass is Amazonic. As you know, it's the largest navigable river in the world. Um, it's home to uh, over 400 indigenous ethnic groups and they in turn speak uh, 300 different languages that belong to 40 linguistic families. Um, just over four years ago, uh, we people in the Catholic Church launched uh, a pan-Amazonic network uh, when we use the term Panamasonic, it's just to refer to the fact that uh, it's about the, the nine countries involved. So the Catholic Church, for our part, uh, have tried and we're trying to take very seriously uh, a new type and a new uh, interest and presence towards the defense of life and the defense of the Amazon region. Um, the main point is, and it's sort of a continue on here from what Joan has shared in New Mexico, is that um, the area is now probably one of the most prized in the whole world for massive capitalist investment, particularly by the major uh, extractive corporations and has been so over the last uh, three or four decades. Um, the result has been, in general terms, uh, the, the huge amount of, um, depends here on your perspective, from one point, from the point of view of power and politics and um, an economic perspective, it's all about development and progress and um, um, the stock market. The other side of the thing is that it's all about as well and uh, a terrible amount of destruction and depredation with all sorts of uh, evil effects for people and for the landmass, for the rainforest and for the natural order. 
So it's a question here of life and death. And we have to sort of make a choice and position ourselves as to what side we're on. Uh, also for all of Latin America, the Amazon has been very much in the public eye, particularly over the last two years because of the level of corruption that goes on between the extractive corporations and um, people engaged in public life. The amount of uh, ex-presidents that are now facing prison sentences all over these countries is terribly high. The election two days ago in Brazil was decided basically on what's happening in the Amazon. And uh, the new president in Brazil uh, does not uh, look like good news for the people that live there, their interests and the Amazon itself. The level of destruction that's happening. Um, the IPCC has established that um, because of uh, the way that extractive industries uh, operate, uh, there is a direct uh, effect of this on the destruction of the rainforest and on climate stability in the world, in the planet. So here we're talking about climate stability, uh, both as quantity and quality. When we talk about quantity, we're talking about the the amount of water or rainfall that depends on a healthy Amazon and the amount of air and oxygen that is available to the whole planet to sustain life. Uh, as we're speaking, we have to realize that 20% of the Amazon is now destroyed uh, and destroyed forever. If the current rate of destruction continues within uh, the coming decades, it's more than likely that 20% more of uh, the drinking water in the world that largely comes from both the Amazon and the Congo in Africa will be reduced by 20%. And the same goes for the amount of oxygen available for people. So this is a, a frightening statistic. Air and water cannot be recreated if we destroy uh, the production of air and water as from the very earth itself. So it means that, um, that we now have to make a real decision about how the world is going to face up to this particular challenge. And it's frightening because the powers that be, there's a very solid and indisputed consensus on the part of national governments in charge of these nation states in collusion with the um, extractive industries that what they are doing is highly unquestioned. So we are in a, in a huge minority. The destruction concerns people, and particularly indigenous people, people, the right to their lands and their cultures that has been there for thousands of years. Um, the destruction of the, the uh, environment. Uh, and also it has to do with the fact that people are not allowed to open their mouths and protest. We're living in what we call the criminalization of protest. During this year alone, there has been 57 deaths, uh, assassinations in the Brazilian Amazon of um, environmental workers. Pope Francis, as you know, uh, as from his encyclical uh, of Laudato Si, um, came to the Amazon in January of this year to a town called Puerto Maldonado in the um, southeast of Peru, that part of the country, which was really a visit to the Amazon to draw attention to all the things that I'm trying to say right now. And the basic uh, outline is that um, 
as we all know, we're talking about God's gift, the gift of life, and the destruction being called to it. Francis's focus is on looking at the world and the planet and the cosmos as our common home, where everything is connected. This is his mantra uh, with a tremendous uh, depth of spirituality, the threat and danger to life on the planet. He also speaks strongly that uh, we can no longer afford to talk about two different types of crises. On the one hand, the social and economic crisis that we have been accustomed to speak about over many decades and whose main victims are the poor and the excluded of the earth, which unfortunately still goes on. And then we have been speaking in relatively recent years or decades about the environmental ecological crisis, whose main victim is the planet itself. Pope says in number 139 of Laudato Si that we now have to integrate both crises and speak of one only integrated crisis, which means a new way of thinking, a new way of speaking that uh, we're not really prepared for. And it's a huge challenge to integrate our, our vision, our way of thinking, our culture, our academic life, and particularly uh, public life, so that we can live or hope to live with a reasonable amount of uh, lucidity or conscious in the planet. Uh, the, Pope Francis, just to just flag with you, I've run out of time, has called for a synod on the Amazon that's already underway since his visit here to the Amazon in January. We're now in the time of the synod. We are uh, working on the basic preparatory document that's, there's 45 uh, territorial uh, meetings happening all over these countries in these months up until January of next year to make the proposals and suggestions from the over 100 ecclesiastical jurisdictions in the Amazon that share the area. And these in turn will be systematized and uh, given back for further discussion before the actual synod meeting in Rome which will be held in October of next year. The theme of the Synod is the Amazon, a new paths and a, the need for a, an e ecological integral conversion. So we're talking about something that has to do a Synod with, um, with the Amazon, a new rostro, a new face for the Amazon, but also there is a universal dimension to this center that implicates the universal church and the, the planet as a whole. So there's a, I, there's a few disjointed uh, thoughts that, uh, that I'm very happy to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, and we'll come back to you because I think there's some questions that are coming in for you. But at this point, uh, we're going to have Marianne come back in uh, to the presentation uh, for uh, a final slide. Marianne? Great. Thank you. Very, very powerful um, examples from both uh, Sister Joan and Father Peter, and I thank you for that. And inevitably, when we hear um, these kind of testimonies and hear about the concerns of our sisters and brothers around the world, we ask, what can I do? I don't live in New Mexico, I don't live in the Amazon, I'm here in Silver Spring, Maryland, what can I do? Um, and so our working group is really thinking through this question and here's just a few very simple things we can call you to. I know Sister Joan had some specific actions to be in solidarity with New Mexico. This is more general about how do we um, address extractivism where we live and in our own lives. The first one is to pray about your relationship with creation and about lifestyle adjustments you can make. 
our opening prayer was from this examine that the Jesuits have put together that really walks through um, various steps and questions, difficult questions like Sister Joan um, shared with us to think about um, our relationship with creation and how we might want to alter our, our lifestyles. Um, Father Peter talked about the synod and the, this is, um, you can see here, this is the actual title of the preparatory document. I didn't put the link here because it's very long and don't think people would want to jot it all down, but you could just Google Amazonia New Paths for the Church and you'll see the preparatory document that really gives a lot of in-depth background um, expands on what Father Peter shared and makes clear that this is a lens for the rest of the world, that the Synod is on the Amazon, but similar questions and concerns could come up around many other parts of the world um, that are being impacted by extractivism and climate change. We invite you to educate yourself, um, justresponse.faith. That's our working group's um, website where we have all kinds of resources. And the Catholic Climate Covenant is going to be inaugurating a new web page on extractivism as well that will um, uh, take people to this page. Other thing I think everyone can do is to look at what are the local groups or groups in your state that are addressing extractive projects. I know we have Sisters of Mercy that are connected with their state interfaith power and light or 350.org are really local groups. So we have sisters that are working against a fracked gas plant in Rhode Island, against the Keystone Pipeline in Nebraska, against a pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac in Michigan, and the list goes on and on. So you can find very particular local projects that you can get involved in, and also um, projects you can get involved in to move toward that just transition that Sister Joan talked about. So we're not just um, opposing things, but also talking, what are we building, moving into that um, very just renewable future. And finally, we can look at our own dependence on the extractivist model. We're talking specifically about fossil fuels, so we reduce our use of oil and gas in any way we can. But in all the other ways that we contribute to the extractivist mentality, the development model, you know, we can buy fair trade and ethically sourced products. We can stop using bottled water because, of course, we know water is also an extractivist uh, commodity when we're taking that from communities to be bottled and then sold. So all these different ways that we can think about um, how we can change our own lifestyles uh, to reduce our dependence on the extractivist model. And so I'll turn it back to Paz for questions and answers, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Peter. At this point, we switch over to a Q&A, and we've got lots of questions coming in. Uh, so hopefully we'll get through most of them. If we don't get to your question, I will send it to the right panelist, and hopefully they can respond individually. Uh, one question here uh, for Sister Joan. Uh, and it has to do with your uh, remarks about methane flaring and wh when it that it should be easily captured. Um, the question is, um, after it, if it's uh, methane after it is captured, but then sent to domestic uh, use for heat or cooking, uh, how much of that then gets released into the atmosphere? So yes, we could be working on capturing on flares. But are we also having an issue with end use um, going into the atmosphere of methane? Well, ideally, of course, we're moving towards uh, not using uh, fossil fuels totally, ultimately, but we're in that uh, period where people still are. Um, capturing the uh, methane flaring, wasting and venting causes much uh, less harm than leaving it flare into the atmosphere in terms of climate change, health implications, and we're also wasting something that God has created. So while using it, of course, is not ideal, we're not living in this ideal world at the moment, um, but we do need to capture that product, and that is being done in a number of places already. 
Um, Colorado has a good rule to do that. Um, Pennsylvania is doing it. New Mexico, we are not. That was the purpose of the BLM and the EPA methane um, capturing rules, which are um, being undone at the federal level right now. Thank you. Here's a question uh, that I think is for all three of you. So if perhaps Marianne goes first, then Joan, then Peter, and if you don't have anything to add, you'll say just pass. Um, it has to do with how can we uh, make folks in urban suburban areas uh, draw the connections between extractivism that is happening in rural areas, for example, and its consequences to urban suburban dwellers. Um, I would simply say uh, share these stories um, and research what impacts there might be in other areas of your own state. I think stories are um, the most impactful way of educating people and getting them to take action. So if you live in an urban area and you don't think you're seeing some of these impacts, find out um, what some of your sisters and brothers in other parts of your state are, are seeing um, in their communities. Um, this is, this, yes, thank you. That's a great answer, Marianne. And I'll just add on to that and affirm that this, the stories are very important. Um, on this one slide I had, I mentioned an organization called Kavu that has been working on climate change and even some of the submersion of island nations earlier. But this year they've been focusing on New Mexico with the oil and gas industry, the methane issue. They've created 15 minute segments, which are stories. They're voices of all kinds of people from around New Mexico and different places speaking of this from the industry to the Native Americans to Hispanics to um, you know, uh, business people, et cetera, sharing the stories. So that those are 15 minute resources that are available for people as well. Uh, so I would say that um, making that human personal connection is what moves our hearts and invite people to explore ways to do that within their faith communities around the dinner table um, in their houses of worship. Uh, Peter, do you have anything to add about how do we get the stories of the Amazon into the hearts and minds of um, folks in developed countries? I'm 100% behind um, what you say about the importance of uh, sharing the stories with the people uh, because the stories are real and they're, they're, they're graphic. And I would say that the stories should be about the very basics of life. You know, when you, when you talk about stories, you talk about real people and you talk about things like water and air. Yeah, the two very basics of life that we cannot, that none of us can do without. And a water and air that are being increasingly interfered with. And the effects of this is what we're seeing in an increasing way if not in your particular part of the US, but uh, just think of what has been happening in Florida and in recent months with Hurricane Michael and the increasing levels of drought and flooding that's happening all over the world and the, all the fires in, uh, in California in recent years. Now, those things don't happen by accident. It's, it's a it's, it's a combination of climactic effect that in, 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 to a great degree has its origin in the Amazon and in places like the Amazon where climate stability is affected. So if we try and link what's happening on your own doorstep and to the lives of people, uh, middle class people and people in general and the poor and the people that suffer more to uh, this thing that we're trying to say about the effects of, of extractive industries. I think that might be a way forward to try and help people to think that we must we must change basically our civilization and our culture. But that's a whole different huge uh, discussion maybe for another moment. <laughs> and, and a few more could, webinars. 
And if I'm sorry, I just want to add one um, one thing is I think we need to be careful in saying that all these um, impacts are being felt in rural areas. I think a lot of us in urban areas could find people who are living in the shadows of oil refineries right in our large cities, coal fired plants. There's a lots of Im the impacts when we're processing uh, fossil fuels and transporting it via pipelines or a lot of urban areas that are facing um, impacts or certainly risks. So look around in your backyard and you might be surprised you find some things closer than you think. Yeah, right. And I, could, I add, could I add one last thing? Pause, I'll be quick. So just to add on what Peter and Marianne were saying, and I think it, it does require us to change our vision and our consciousness to that kind of integral ecology where we're seeing that everything's connected and the earth and the economics are not separate. And even in our, our work in our communities, I know immigration is a huge issue. Uh, a lot of women, religious and others are working on human trafficking. If you follow those issues, you, you find that one of the root causes of some of these concerns is climate injustice and climate change. And um, to have that put on those kind of lenses, we need to change the glasses that we have. And um, so I think that can help too in the stories and making the connections. Yeah, uh, this is not a question. It was a statement uh, to also raise up the human health impact of asthma, lung disease, premature birth, um, premature death from the pollution, and that that might be how we can motivate folks. Um, so that's a good point. And that brings me to a question that I believe is for all three, and I'm going to re-kind of focus it. The question has to do that, uh, how do we get Catholic pro-life movement uh, to start speaking out on the issues of climate change to make the connections on life. And I'll let any of the three panelists try to pitch in on that one. Um, it's normally ladies first. <laughs> Go ahead, just, Peter. Just <laughs> um, the overall matrix the idea that uh, holds the whole thing together is the primacy of life. Uh, whether you're a believer or whether you're a non-believer, like what's at stake here is um, the possibility of life and the future of life on planet Earth and um, the access or availability that we're going to have to be able to live both humans and plant life and animal life. So when we're talking about, you know, the pro-life movement, well, obviously the pro-life movement is something very important, but I think it has to sort of try and see that it has to sort of resituate itself in a wider and in a greater context so that Pro, the pro-life movement as we know it and as we have it is a component of this greater life movement that involves the future of life on earth and these huge issues in relation to climate change and um, intergenerational justice and life for the present generation's grandchildren and everything that's to come. That was a great answer. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else need want to add anything to it? Um, this is Joan. I would just like to confirm or affirm what Peter said, and also just to invite people um, to continue to make those connections and that broader um, a view of the future of life on the planet. And even if you run into um, uh, obstacles, in speaking that way, just to continue, because we need to reframe um, this conversation. Yep. Okay. Mary, anything, or should I just go on? I just say amen to all that was said. Okay. Uh, a really quick question, and I think maybe Peter can start on this one. Um, what is the timing of the Amazon uh, Synod? You had said something about January, but people are confused. And how can the U.S. Catholic Church, how can people in the U.S. Catholic Church be involved? 
Okay, the timing. We, we are now in the time of the Synod. The Pope has pointed out that the Synod is not a question just for the few weeks when the thing ends and when the bishops meet in Rome, which will be in October of 2019, October of next year. The Synod began in January of this year, right? So the basic document was drawn up and is in circulation since June. And from June until January is the period where people can read the basic document. It's available on the web, yeah? And uh, it's, it's for the whole church. Uh, we're speaking now to people in the US, but in your community, in your religious communities, in your parish communities, wherever you are, the old document is quite easy to read and uh, work on it and reflect on it. And you can send in through your local church to the secretary of the synod, your own suggestions and your own opinions, because it also has to do with new pastoral ways and issues about things like ministries, which obviously are in crisis in the Amazon, but there's a kind of a, an effect uh, for the general for the universal church and all of this particularly when we talk about the lack of priests and obligatory celibacy and all this those sort of issues which might seem side issues but from our pastoral point of view are very much part of the whole thing as well so anyway um the the, the discussion period the work period goes on until it's very soon it's it's over at the end of January, but your 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 suggestions and your opinions can be sent, and we will guarantee that they'll be heard uh, by the secretariat, and then the work document will be produced sometime around May or June of next year, and the final part of it will be in uh, in uh, Rome. We're hoping very much that, uh, that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a great feeling about the Senate and possibility of flexibility by the Pope that indigenous people could even be part and participant of the event, that it won't be just in a canonical way restricted just to the bishops. Okay. Thank you, and I'm sure that um, the Covenant will be following uh, the Synod and will be reporting about it in our newsletters and other uh, right. means of communication. Uh, this question, I think, might um, be the uh, last one. I'm pause. sorry, somebody? Yeah, pause. This is Joan. Let me just add a quick thing that might be a resource for people. Uh, the And I might have the name, the correct name wrong, but I think it's the Catholic um, uh, a Pontifical Mission Council or Society. Um, there are representatives in a number of dioceses. They had their national meeting here in New Mexico during the summer. This was the topic that they had. I spoke at that because they wanted to make the domestic connection with the Amazon. So I know they are working on this as well. If there are mission offices um, in some of your dioceses, that may be uh, uh, an avenue or a venue to connect with. Okay, and I'll, I'll look into it and see if I can put up a link for that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a question for Joan, and it's quite, um, it's on the issue of the status of solar and wind development in New Mexico. Given that New Mexico is a sunshine state, uh, how much of that is happening? How much training to local workers for economic development is going on? Um, we are doing as much as we can. Uh, we have been um, hindered somewhat um, by um, in-state um, who has been in political power in our state. Um, we are working on a renewable port, increasing the renewable portfolio standard in the state and a number of other initiatives that hopefully we can get um, through our legislature in um, coming in uh, January. 
But I might also just mention that it's not just the installation of these elements that bring in jobs, it's also the manufacturing. And at this point, we are really not a manufacturer of these. We have uh, sort of, this is my personal opinion, been missing the boat in that. And I know in the past, I don't know if it's correct now, but one of the largest um, manufacturers of solar, and it's probably a state that uses the least, is New Jersey. Um, so there's different uh, components to this. We have been working on this. We realize we have a lot of that wind and solar and we're trying to move on it given um, certain um, limitations that we've been facing. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Um, given that I try to keep uh, the webinar to the one hour, we have reached the one hour. There are lots of questions we didn't get to but I will share all the questions with the panelists and between all of us, we will respond to you. Uh, at this point though, we will um, uh, start finishing up. I will leave you with these two um, for more information. Uh, I believe Marianne did talk about how the Covenant has now a web page for extractivism. The link is there. And you can also email us at info at Catholic Climate Covenant. Uh, for more information. Uh, as always, any questions that you might have, any follow-up, uh, just drop me an email and I will try to send it to the right panelist or respond to it myself. Uh, a huge thank you to all three of our panelists, Sister Joan, Father Peter, and Marianne. Thank you, thank you. And a thank you to all of you who joined us today. Uh, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day and we will be speaking uh, with you at our next webinar hopefully next month thank you god bless bye-bye bye-bye thank you thank you pass thank you everybody thank you. blessings thank you